As we read the Bible, one thing is very clear when it comes to doing what's right. Doing what's right is not usually easy. There's usually a lot of obstacles you have to overcome in order to actually do what's right. There's usually a sacrifice involved with doing what's right. We see Jesus Christ as the best example. You know, in order to do what was right, he went through a lot of suffering. He went through a lot of trials. He had, you know, he had a hard time. He had temptations. It was not easy to just do, automatically do what's right. That's one of the reasons why church is so important, reading your Bible is so important, because especially living in the flesh that we live in, we're going to be guided and steered into doing things that are wrong, into, into making poor decisions, into not doing the right thing, because it's going to be easier. It's the, the path of least resistance is, leads to, the, to that broad gate that leads to destruction. One of the difficulties that we have in choosing to do right is the fact that we have emotions. Now, thank God for our emotions. Emotions are not a bad thing. So it is, you know, let me get that out of, out of the way, first of all, because emotions are great. There's a good reason for us to have emotions. God has blessed us with emotions as human beings, and he's given us the ability to feel it, you know, love and, and all these great emotions, as well as even some of the negative emotions that God has, you know, give us this, uh, this, the capabilities to have the sense of having emotion. However, emotion can lead you astray if you're relying on your feelings to determine what you ought to do. Give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. There are times you may know what's right, but you have a certain feeling. You have an emotion towards a subject where following your emotion is not going to be what's right. And here's my example is that a person may have strong feelings of love right inside, internally for another person. You may start to have this, oh, I, I'm infatuated with this person. I love this person, you know, whatever it is. But what if that other person is married? You can't just let your feelings take over because that's wickedness. That's adultery. If you're going to pursue these feelings that you're experiencing inside your body, going after something that God's told us, hey, that's not right. You can't do that. Or maybe you're married. Or maybe neither one of you are married. Maybe you're both single, but the other person's not a believer. And you're just, you're just looking to go get married to somebody who's not a believer. You know, the Bible says that, that we're not to be yoked up together with unbelievers. So there's things, the Bible gives us very clear instructions on what is right and what is wrong. This is where we need to be choosing for ourselves that we will be following the right path versus the wrong path and not allowing our emotions to cloud our judgment to cast doubt on what's right and what's wrong. And this, I mean, the, the TV, the movies, the media, when, especially when it comes to the subject of love, they're going to be trying to cloud your understanding of right and wrong. They do everything they can to put up in your veil. Oh, but I just, you know, this is my soulmate. This is, oh, God brought us together. Well, God didn't bring you together. Don't bring God into this if you, you know, you're already married to somebody else and now you're going to look to get a divorce to go marry this person. That's wickedness. But see, that's the way that Hollywood's going to project to you that you should be doing and that it's all for love because love's the greatest thing and, you know, and this other nonsense. But we have the word of God. We know what's right and wrong. We should know what's right and wrong based on what's written in this book. And the things that are written here are true without emotion. But see, our emotions play a big part of our life. They, they could have a big pull on us. And we need to make sure that we're temperate and in control in many aspects. Now, the, I'm going to be steering this sermon in one particular direction tonight. I just preached on, um, you know, with, with being able to manage your anger and being patient. That's another element where you can not have good control or where you could let your emotions of being angry 
take over and make bad decisions, make the wrong decisions, do things that are not right because you've allowed yourself to become too angry or to be too proud in a situation to be able to just swallow your own pride, be humble and do what's right and esteem others better than yourself. You know, take a right course of action and not allowing your anger to dictate what you do. When you make it angry at somebody for doing something to you and what your flesh wants to do, what your emotion wants to do is go over there and sock the guy in the face. Right? Because they did some wrong to you. But that's not what's right. And see, to do what's right, you have to know what God's Word says. You know, we shouldn't just, just do violence to people because they wrong us. We need to restrain ourselves, control ourselves, control your emotions, and don't let your emotions cloud your thinking to the point where you say, I'm just going to just go and do whatever my flesh wants me to do, whatever this emotion I'm feeling at the time is telling me to do. Fear is another example of an emotion. You can have, the Bible calls it the spirit of fear, but it, I think you could kind of lump it in with emotions. The Bible doesn't really talk about emotions in that word. So, um, but we know what emotions are in our, in our vernacular today. And being fearful, you know, there's a purpose for having some fear if you're, if you're you know, on, on top of some skyscraper and, you know, like, you ought to be a little fearful to get too close to that edge. There's nothing wrong with that because it's a, it's a protective mechanism that God's given us to not do stupid, too, you know, things that are just too stupid because that is stupid. You, know, you, don't, you don't need to be tempting your fate, your, 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 your life by just being, you know, so close to death. But, but that being said, I mean, there's a legitimate purpose for that. There's a legitimate purpose for love, the feeling of love. I love my wife. Hey, that's a great, that's a, that, that's a great thing to experience. It's something God's given us. It's a blessing to have that, right? Those are, those are good reasons. You, even anger. You have an emotion of anger where you're righteous and justified as long as you're in control. It's not necessarily a bad thing. We ought to be angry at sin. We ought to be angry with the wickedness of this world. It ought to drive us to do what's right. But how you deal with that and, and the way that you allow yourself to um, be manipulated within your own emotions is gonna, you know, is where the problem comes in. Is if you're allowing your flesh to take over using your emotion or you using your emotion to do what's right. And allowing your emotion to, 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 to come to the surface. You know, allowing your, your emotions of love within marriage, there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, great. Praise God for that. Allowing your emotions to come up of anger over sin and over wickedness, yes, and direct that appropriately. Use your head to, to not be sinning and not let that, that anger overcome you and start doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Fear. Allow the fear to, to not let you do really stupid things, but, but be very, very clear to recognize where fear is going to prevent you from doing something you should be doing. Like going out and preaching the gospel and winning souls of people. You need to be able to overcome that fear that you have and decide, no, I'm going to do what's right and not let my emotions determine what I'm going to do. Now, the, what I'm, the direction I'm going to take tonight specifically has to do with overcoming emotions that the situation itself is already going to make you uncomfortable. It's not going to be a fun situation to deal with. It has to do with, with our interactions with other people and, and when we need to maybe break fellowship and things like that. And you may have strong emotions for people. Well, we need to be able to overcome that in order to do what's right. There are things that are not dealt with maybe on a regular basis. So they're a little bit more foreign to us. And it's easy to rely on certain emotions. But we need to know what is the right thing to do in God's eyes and be able to go forward with that because it's right. There are things that you do that are unpleasant, emotionally speaking, that might cause you some stress, that might cause you a little bit of anguish to do. A good example, I was just talking about was soul winning. For me, before I got used to going out soul winning, before it becomes second nature, like now, I love going soul winning. I knew, first I had to realize this is the right thing to do. And just determine that and get that settled. This is what the Bible says is right to do. 
I was deathly afraid of it and it would literally cause me anxiety and other things to actually go out and open up my mouth and try to preach the gospel to somebody. It was not emotionally, it wasn't pleasant at all. It is not something I would want to subject myself to. So the, the path of least resistance, the easiest thing to do would be, I'm not going to do this because it's very uncomfortable and not pleasant for me to do. But when you know what's right and you're not going to let your emotions dictate what you do, you can say, no, I will do this and I'm going to get through it because it's right. Well, there's other areas too. And what, the reason why we started out in Matthew 27 tonight is we have the story of Judas at the beginning of the chapter. Okay, Judas was one of the 12 disciples. We all know that. Judas made friends with the other disciples. I'm sure of that. They were... They were traveling together with Jesus Christ. They were ministering unto people. They were doing things as a group. It's a small, I mean, think about you and, and 12 other guys. Traveling around without your family, without a home, you know, I mean, literally going through events and times that are not easy to deal with. You're going you're gonna to bond. You're going you're gonna to build relationships and friendships with one another because you're going from place to place and it's just you. You know each other. You're friends. You're, you're working together. You're, you're fellow laborers. But Judas was a traitor. Judas was not who he said he was. Judas presented himself to be a believer Judas presented himself to be this disciple and loving God and everything else, but we know that he wasn't. I mean, we have the luxury of knowing that because we got the whole word of God. The disciples at that time didn't know. He was among them, friendly with them. And look at what happens here in, in verse number three when Judas is, after Jesus Christ is arrested, Judas Iscariot felt bad for what he did. He was a person too. I mean, we, you know, the, Jesus Christ said he's a devil, amen and amen. He was wicked, but he was a person. And see, here's, here's where the problem can come in and where people start to feel uncomfortable is when you see emotion from someone else to start to have the pity and compassion on someone. In many cases, having pity and compassion, you know, in vast majority of places, we're, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's all right. It's a great thing to be compassionate towards people and to have pity on people. But there are certain situations where we should not have those emotions and you might need to rule over your emotions and flesh on what you might want to do in order to do what's right. So in Matthew 27, look at verse number three. The Bible says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, talking about Jesus, when Jesus was condemned, he saw Wow, Jesus is actually being put to death now because of what I did, because I got him arrested, I pointed him out, I made this happen, now he's being put to death. He says he repented himself. Now, this is the narrator of the Bible. This isn't Judas saying he repented, but actually did in his heart. The Bible is saying, look, he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Judas felt bad for betraying Jesus Christ. Judas took the money back. He's like, I don't, I, I, I don't know what I was saying. I don't, know, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Threw it down at their feet. You know, and they're like, you already did it. It's over. You can't, you can't turn back from it now. You, know, you deal with that. And he felt so bad about betraying Jesus Christ that he went and hung himself. Now turn, if you would, to Psalm 109. He killed himself because he felt that bad. When you hear about someone killing themselves, what you want to do normally is have sympathy for that person. Be compassionate towards that person. Right? In the case of Judas Iscariot, no. And we're going to see that clearly taught in Scripture. No. You don't show sympathy to the traitor, the devil, that literally destroyed Jesus Christ. Judas Iscariot was a reprobate. It doesn't matter that he had these 
feelings, these emotions, and this sorrow once he's already been the devil and betrayed Jesus Christ. We don't let up on the Judas because of, you know, just because all of a sudden maybe he shed some tears and he's, and he's crying about something that he did that was super wicked. We're going to see how God views that and why I'm even making this statement, that, you know, to the, even all the way up to this point. Psalm 109 is the Holy Spirit or Jesus Christ's perspective on Judas Iscariot. Psalm 109, we're going to start reading in verse number 8. This should sound familiar to you because it's quoted in the book of Acts. Verse 8, let his days be few and let another take his office. Let another take his office. This is quoted in the book of Acts when Matthias is appointed to be the, the other disciple because Judas, Judas fell by transgression, because his office was left empty. So when they replaced him in Acts, in, uh, I believe it's chapter 2, they, um, they quote this verse, let another take his office. Just so you know, this is talking about Judas Iscariot in this passage. Psalm 109, verse 8, let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. This is a curse on Judas Iscariot because of what he's done. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let the strangers spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. Neither let there be any favor to his fatherless children. This is going beyond even just Judas Iscariot himself and goes, continues on to his children. He's saying, have no mercy on this guy. He doesn't deserve it. For what he did is so wicked that he deserves everything coming to him. And, 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 and you shouldn't be showing mercy on him. Don't show mercy on him. And look, if God's not going to show mercy on someone, why would it be right for us to? Do we think we're better than God to extend mercy on someone whose God says, who Jesus Christ says, don't show mercy on him? Let's keep reading here. He says in uh, verse 13, let his posterity be cut off. Again, talking about his children. And in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. See, there are, and it goes on and on. I'm not going to keep reading the rest of this passage. You go home and read it later tonight, the whole Psalm 109. This also lets you in a little bit more into who Judas Iscariot was than we really get all the, de we don't get all the details in the New Testament. We know that he was a thief just because the Bible tells us that he was a thief. But see, his fellow disciples didn't know that. He was just one of the guys. He was a fellow laborer. In his heart, he was extremely wicked. He didn't care about the, he didn't care about the poor. He didn't care about these other people. He cared about himself. But you know what he was able to do? Put on a big show, put on a big front, and get people to accept him and make him think, oh, he's not that bad of a guy. This is the, deceit, the extreme deceitfulness of the Judas Iscariot. Win you over emotionally as a friend so that you can't see how wicked their heart really is. And when they get exposed, then to still gain some sympathy and mercy and everything else. When Judas Iscariot gets, get, got exposed, and the curse from Psalm 109 from Jesus Christ, this is the perspective of Jesus Christ, if you get the whole thing in context, was don't show mercy on him. And the wicked reprobates of this world, that is the attitude that God has. They are going to receive no mercy. It's difficult because it's not, in general, that's not in our Christian nature to not extend mercy to people because we see how loving and compassionate and merciful God is. 
So this is one of those areas where it's going to be uncomfortable, potentially, to do what's right. But what's right is laid out for us. Turn, if you would, to um, stay in Psalm, Psalm 78. Jesus Christ knew that he was a devil. In John 6, 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Of course, this wasn't news to Jesus that Judas was a devil. But think about just the, the, the connotation of being called a devil anyways. I mean, a devil is extremely... How much, what, what worse can you say about someone than you're a devil? How anti-God and anti-Christ can you get than being called a devil? But Jesus knew the truth. The problem is that these devils, they want to make you think that they're not really devils, too. I mean, obviously, that's where the, the term, the wolf in sheep's clothing, comes in. Because on the outside, they want everybody to think that they are a sheep, too. That they're a believer. That they're a friend. You're, you're, you know, we're good. And they may get sad over the wickedness that they do. But that doesn't make them cease to be a devil. See, the thing is about the wolf in sheep's clothing is that inside they are a wolf. Make no mistake about it. The whole point of the, the wolf in sheep's clothing that comes in is to devour the other sheep. Now they're trying to keep up their, their facade. I'm a sheep too because they want to destroy. And, and this is one of the problems I think that people would have in being able to overcome their own emotions of being compassionate towards someone is how difficult it is for a normal person, for a saved person, to understand how somebody can be so wicked. How somebody can be devising evil and devising splitting people up and doing these things that it's hard to even comprehend that people like that actually exist. It really is. It still boggles my mind that people are out there that are really bent and planning and trying to hurt people. And to destroy people, to destroy little children, to, to, to split up churches, to do anything against what's good and holy and right. That there's people that that is their goal and that's what they want to do. And they don't care what they have to do to destroy. But those people exist. Judas Iscariot was one of those people. He was bringing Jesus Christ down. He infiltrated. He got everyone to believe him and to think that he was one of them. Except for Jesus, he already knew. No one else knew. When they asked at the Last Supper, you know, Lord, who is it? Who is it? He even told them and they didn't realize it. He it is that dip at the sop with me. And, you know, okay. Can't be Judas. That thou do, do quickly. Can't be Judas. He had everyone tricked. But he's the devil. Psalm 78, look at verse number 36. And see, this is why it's difficult for us. And this is why it's hard to, to do what's right, especially in this aspect. We're going to see how full of compassion God is. Verse 36, Psalm 78. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. This is talking about God's people not being good to God by just flattering God with their mouth and lying with their tongues to God and their heart not being right and not being steadfast in the covenant with God. This is not people who are doing good to God. But look at God's attitude, verse 38. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Did they deserve destruction? You better believe they deserved, deserved destruction. But God was full of compassion. He forgave their iniquity. It says, Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Praise God for his compassion and mercy. And the Bible talks a lot about this, about his compassion. I'm going to read just, you don't have to turn, I'm going to read through some verses about God's compassion. Because 
we cannot overlook God's compassion at all. I mean, this is the majority of what we see in the Bible is going to be God's compassion as far as an attribute of God, which makes it all the more important when you see don't show mercy on someone. Because when you understand the compassionate uh, attitude and, and, and spirit of the Lord, you know it's really bad when someone is not receiving of that compassion. Psalm 86.15 says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 111.4, He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Psalm 112.4, Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Psalm 145.8, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Lamentations 3.22, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. And then Matthew 18. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 19. I'm going to read Matthew 18, 33. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? This is that parable of the, the man that was forgiven that great debt. Remember, we just went over this about a week ago, and then he turned to, to this other guy that owed him way less money, and he didn't have compassion. He didn't forgive him his debt. He just was like, you're going to pay me what you owe me. But what's important I want to point out in this, in this verse particularly, he said, Shouldest not thou have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? It's important to, to draw the, the, the synonymous relationship between having compassion and having pity okay, in Scripture. Because what we're going to show you here in Deuteronomy 19 is that we still need to maintain the proper balance on when we should be compassionate and when we should not be compassionate. Our human emotions are going to probably drive us to want to be compassionate towards people many times, especially when someone hasn't maybe directly done you wrong. It's a little bit different if someone, you know, kills your child, right? You're a lot less likely to be compassionate on the person in that situation. But if it's something removed from yourself, happening to other people, and other people are experiencing, it's a lot easier to play on your emotions of having compassion towards people. And look, it's not always bad, so don't, you know, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's very specific, the situations that we're, that we're kind of dealing with here, when not to be compassionate. In Deuteronomy 19, it gives us an example of when not to be compassionate, not to have pity. Verse number 11, but if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and fleeth in one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Thine eyes shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. So the Bible is saying, look, if there's someone guilty of premeditated murder, they're lying in wait. I mean, their, their goal is to destroy somebody. They lie in wait. They kill them. They're guilty. They have murdered someone else. Don't have pity on them. That person deserves to die. That is the sentence that needs to be carried out because what happens? When you start having pity on someone, oh, well, maybe that's a little too harsh of a sentence to actually put them to death. This is where we're at today. It's this concept of showing pity on people that don't deserve pity. When you premeditate somebody's murder, you deserve to die. But what do we want to do today? Well, what kind of childhood did he have? Well, what kind of factors did he have? What, what's going on in his life? Oh, what's all this stuff? You know, and start gaining sympathy for the fact that somebody chose to end another person's life willfully and just lying in wait and I'm going to kill him. The Bible warns about not having pity for him. Because we need, you know, by, by not showing the pity, you're going to make it go well with you so that the innocent blood is, uh, is not, you're, you don't have the guilt of that innocent blood. Let's keep reading here, verse number 16 of Deuteronomy 19. 
If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall then henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. This is the judgment of God. This is what God says is right. We need to determine in our heads, this is right. So when your emotion wants to take over and say, yeah, but I want to have compassion and pity on this person, you say no, because God said not to. Because what's right is what they're going to get and what they're going to deserve, or what they do deserve. They're going to get it. And <clears throat> in this kid's situation, you say, yeah, but they didn't even do any, any harm to somebody because it's just a false witness, right? He just lied about it. And what this is saying, in case you didn't catch it or if you've never seen this before, what the Bible teaches is that if somebody is going to testify against someone else and be a witness to a crime and say, you know, if I, if I were to say, stand up in court, Brother Robert pulled the trigger and killed this other person, right? If I were to stand up and do that and bear a witness, but I was lying about that, well, guess what? If Robert were convicted of murder, premeditated murder, that's the death sentence. I didn't kill anybody, but if I bear a false witness that would get him killed and it's found out that I lied about that, according to the Bible, I deserve the death sentence because of that lie and that I don't deserve any pity at all. Don't pity. Carry forth the judgment because that's what's right. No compassion, no pity, do what's right. And that may be insensitive. That may make you feel uncomfortable. But it's not righteous for you to have those feelings. God tells us what's right. We need to choose to do and be able to overcome emotions and say, nope, this is right. There are punishments that need to be meted out. They need to be measured. It needs to, to come to pass. And it's important that we don't go soft on these crimes, especially the crime you know, that the Bible lays out. But we have. Now, in similar manner, there are people when judgment comes to them or when things happen that we don't need, we ought not to be being compassionate on and showing pity on, and one of those people is Judas Iscariot, we saw as a great example. Other people that fall into that same exact category, the Bible refers to as people of children of the devil, wolves in sheep's clothing, and false prophets. Uh, another term is reprobate, concerning the faith, someone who's rejected of God. Those, these are all terms that the Bible uses. I don't believe that a saved person is a wolf or can ever be a wolf because the wolf seeks to destroy and devour and they come in under pretenses to destroy. That is not a wolf. I mean, that's not a saved person. That's a wolf. And when you read these contexts of wolves, this is talking about people who, who are lying in wait to destroy. Now, I also believe that's why it's, we ought to be very careful in our terminology and what we accuse, if you're going to accuse, if you're going to mark somebody or label somebody as a wolf, as a child of the devil, as a false prophet, it carries a weight. Because those people, according to God, are already damned to hell and not able to be saved beyond redemption. And they're going to split hell wide open when they go to hell. So we want to be wise and reserve our judgment usually unless we have very good reason and very good, you know, a good picture of, yes, this person is just 
fitting what the Bible says about a reprobate or a false teacher to a T, right? The Bible gives us the information so that we can make judgment calls. But we want to be careful about that because you don't want to be thrown around a phrase or a term about somebody that is so serious in nature. Because it really is here. Because a, a, a wolf, we were talking about this a little bit before service, you know, a, a wolf, a false prophet, is never allowed in this church, ever. As long, you know, if, if we can figure them out, if we know that someone is a known wolf, someone's a known child of Belial, they're not allowed here. But if somebody's gotten screwed up on some things and maybe preached heresy or something like that, that's, but they're still a believer, there's redemption for them. They're not a reprobate, right? If they're a believer, if they've just gotten screwed up and, 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 and not, you know, just wrong on doctrines. So we want to make sure that when you label someone, we know for good reason that they're going to be, you know, and I'm not opposed to using these terms. For, I mean, People are called out all the time in the Bible for being false prophets, for being wolves. I mean, it's, it's something that we need to do because believers need to know, the sheep need to know that there's a wolf around. But we don't want to be crying wolf when they're not really a wolf. And just that phrase, just so you know, I was going to go into this a little bit of detail on, you know, when the Bible talks about children of the devil. I don't believe that every unsaved person is a child of the devil. Just like every person in the world is not a child of God. We become a child of God when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when we're born again. But as many as received him, them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's when you become God's son or God's child. In like manner, someone becomes a child of the devil when they become reprobate. When they are unsaved. Just, just as much as you can never lose your salvation, you are saved forever. It's an eternal thing. You're born of God. You're born in that family. You're in that family forever. When you're born of the devil, the devil's your father. You're in the devil's family forever. So if you go to John chapter 8, Matthew 23, I'll just read this for you. Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees. Matthew 23, 13, the Bible says, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. He's saying you're preventing people from getting saved here. You're not saved, and you're also working against it. You're preventing people from getting saved. And then in verse 15, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. A proselyte is a disciple or a follower. Right? He's saying, you go to great lengths to get one convert, to get one proselyte, to get someone to follow after you. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. The, the people that Jesus Christ is talking to here are bad trees. They're corrupt trees. They cannot bring forth good fruit. They're bringing forth after their own kind. These are false prophets that he's talking to because they're bringing forth, the only thing that they're able to bring forth, the fruit and their followers are people who are also damned. People are also reprobate. Jude, the book of Jude refers to these people as being twice dead. I'll read the verse for you, verse 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. They're spiritually dead, and they're twice dead. And the warning in the book of Jude is that these are people that feast with you. These people will be around you. This is going to be just like the example of Judas Iscariot. He was with them the whole time and accepted as being one of them. Yet he was a devil. Yet he was a traitor. Yet he was twice dead. It's a reality. It's an unfortunate reality for, for us, you know, to have to, to deal with this and, and know that there's people like this out there. But nonetheless, we need to be aware of it. John chapter 8, verse number 42. 
Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, this is where they were claiming to be children of Abraham, right? The people he's talking to. And Jesus tell them, No, you're not a child of Abraham. If you were of, your, of, of Abraham, you'd do the works of Abraham. Verse number 42 says, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus Christ knew that these people were of their father the devil. They're doing the works of the devil. They're, they're, these people are reprobate. It's the exact opposite of being born of God with God being your father. See, he's, he's, that's why he said they hated Jesus and they wanted to have him killed. See, if you were a child of God, you would love me. You wouldn't hate me and go about to kill me because they're of the devil. It's really straightforward. You know, it's not, this concept isn't very difficult to, to see in the Bible. What is more difficult is when the people are found out in how to deal with them. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There are times, and I've gone over this in the past, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, one, on this one topic, but there's times when it's biblical to shun people. Now, it's a word that a lot of times I think churches don't like to use, that word, but it's an appropriate term. And the reason why churches don't want to like to use that, that term, I think, is because of the, the cults, Right? There's a lot of cults out there that teach shunning where they take this to, to a, a level that is just completely inordinate and wrong and weird and creepy and, and, and by design to just continue to brainwash people. So that is completely wrong. Obviously, the Jim Jones, right? They practice shunning where people would stop talking to their family. They'd stop talking to friends. They would stop talking to everybody except for the Jim Jones followers, right? If you're not in the Jim Jones camp, I'm not going to talk to you. And they would completely get every other influence out of their life completely. The Bible doesn't teach us to do that. The Bible teaches us, and we're gonna, we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself again. There is a time to not eat with people, to not fellowship with people, and that is shunning. You're, you're not having anything to do with them. It's not a comfortable situation. Sometimes it may seem harsh, and, and especially after you've built a friendship with somebody. That is when the emotions kick in. I know this person. I've gone soul winning with this person. They're a friend of mine. I've helped them out financially. They've helped me out. You know, whatever the case may be, you could be in a church, in a, in a, in a fellowship, but when someone is found out either to be a Judas or to fit the bill of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 here and be guilty of these sins, someone who's called a brother, that the Bible says, you know what, don't even eat with that person. We got to do what's right. You have to be able to overcome your emotions and not let that dictate what's right and what's wrong. Because unfortunately, some people might say, well, this doesn't feel right. Don't rely on your emotions to tell you what's right and wrong. We need to rely on God's word to tell us what's right and wrong and be willing to do things that go against what our emotion or what our flesh is trying to, to get us to do. Look at verse number 1 in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So this church in Corinth had a person that was fornicating and it was known in the church that he's committing fornication and it wasn't even just fornication between a man and a woman as happens in life. It was his father's wife. 
that he was committing fornication with. That's really perverted and, and wrong and disgusting. You know, it doesn't tell us if, if they were divorced. We assume, I assume that she was, but it doesn't matter. That's just weird, okay? And that was extreme, and that is extremely wicked. And, he's, and what he said is by them not dealing with this of like, hey, that person should be taken away from among you because you don't just allow anything that, to go on in the church. You have to have some standards. You have to have something where you say, you know what? You are setting forth a bad example. You're bringing leaven into this church and you're going to corrupt everybody. You just need to go and get right with God. But because they didn't have that attitude, he says, you're puffed up. You are full of pride. You, you church members are not willing to separate from this person. You are lifted up in pride. You are not acting right. He says, For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. A lot of times people might have a problem thinking, oh, it's real harsh to shun somebody. The Apostle Paul is talking about delivering someone unto Satan. If you think shunning somebody is harsh, how about delivering them to the devil? Say, let the devil have his way with you. This is what's scriptural. Don't let your emotions cloud your judgment on things that need to be done. It may be uncomfortable. It may not be pleasant. I'm not saying I'm, I necessarily... It, you know what? Maybe it's wrong for me not to take joy in something like this. Because it might be my own pity or compassion coming through when I ought not to have it. But this is what's right. We're gonna, we, you know, we need, if we're going to be biblical and do what God wants us to do, we need to be able to look at these passages and say, this is what I will do. This is what I'm willing to go through. And uh, you have to turn there, but in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible reads, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Again, another example of people being delivered unto Satan. This is what needs to happen. This is just. This is right. Watch out for Hymenaeus and Alexander. They were doing much evil. They were causing division, which is why it says, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. They're causing destruction. He says, I delivered them unto Satan. Let Satan have, have his way with you. You saw what Satan was able to do to Job. He said, let Satan have his way with you. And sometimes that needs to be the case. And we need to have that type of a tough love for someone where that is what needs to happen. But again, I mean, it's not over every little thing. These are serious problems. It's a serious sin committing fornication with your father's wife. This isn't your everyday occurrence. And hopefully it's not. At least if we are, we're living in Sodom. Now, I'll admit this to you because this is, some, this is a piece of knowledge that I gained over years. There were times when I attended Faithful Word Baptist Church that I witnessed people getting thrown out of the church and I witnessed church discipline take place from people that I knew because I was a member of the church. I mean, I was a faithful member. I was there all the time, me and my wife. And, and my, we were talking about this when I was preparing for the sermon the other day. You know, we both... Where, you know, situations would come up where I remember not agreeing with the way things were handled. So, you know, I, I don't think that's right. That shouldn't be, you know, I kept it to myself. You know, I wasn't, whatever. Like, like, I saw some things and I was thinking, you know what? I don't think that's right. I think they overreacted. I think there was, a you know, a little bit of a rush of judgment or whatever. Being in the situation myself personally. Ultimately, I couldn't quite see how bad the things that happened actually were. I was desensitized to how wicked the things that had been going on were, which is why I thought there was harshness, which is why I thought, hey, they shouldn't have been dealt that way. I thought the reaction was too severe. 
And I was a faithful soul winning member for a few years at this point. So it wasn't, I wasn't just some brand new believer or someone who didn't have like a whole lot of knowledge. Just to give you a little of insight of where I was spiritually and everything else, I had been growing. I've learned, I'd learned quite a bit at this point, but I still lacked experience in this area and didn't have the proper perspective on how wicked the sin was until later. It took a little while. It took, I, I, when I saw the end result of everything, then I started to realize how bad these people really were, how wicked they really were inside, and the destruction they were out to cause. I didn't see that at first. But see, I still didn't have a great deal of knowledge either. I still wasn't viewing things the right way. And I know this now for a fact. I'm, if this isn't just justify, you know, justifying someone that I, that I respected you know, after the fact. No, this is something that I disagreed at first, but when I saw the end result and everything kind of came to light, he was just able to pick up on it way before I was. He understood the MO. He understood the path. He's seen wolves before. I didn't understand that they were a wolf. I saw some things, but didn't, well, that's not that bad. He saw that they were a wolf. And at the end result, when people start going down and, and just calling all the different members of the church and trying to pit everyone against each other and cause all kinds of strife and problems and division and literally trying to split the church, oh, this is what they're all about. That's when the light came on for me. Now, I'm sharing that with you just to keep in mind when things happen. Thank God we don't have this problem. We haven't had this problem in our church yet, but it's going to happen. There's going to come a point where a wolf is in here and needs to be dealt with and needs to be cast out. It's going to happen. If it doesn't happen, we're not doing enough for God to get the attention of the devil to try to split up this church. Bottom line, it's going to happen. The Bible says when they feast with you. This will happen. We need to be prepared and not let the wolf have so much influence that you start thinking that biblical discipline is a little bit too harsh. You need to remember to be able to get over emotions that you may feel because you might be tied to someone who was a friend to you but turned out to be stabbing everyone in the back here trying to cause divisions and, and cause problems. Because that is extremely wicked. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You should be in chapter 5. Just flip over to chapter 11. Just a few thoughts on the things that have recently happened in other churches so that you understand how important it is to have a pastor that diligently watches and will act appropriately when needed. Because that is important to have. It's easy to be an armchair quarterback in situations. It's easy to judge pastors. It's easy to judge other people on what they should or shouldn't be doing and everything else and casting your own judgment when you're not dealing with everything, when you're not in charge of a flock, when you're not the one looking out for the well-being and the safety of the people in your church. That is a serious task to do. And oftentimes there are things that, that happen that you have no knowledge about or experience with that might not, you might not have the full picture of what's going on as well. But the things that were done at Faithful Word Baptist Church were extremely wicked things that were going on with people spreading heresies and, and literally pulling people away and recruiting people out of that church. That is really, really wicked. Don't, don't make any bones about it. You know, people, you, just, you simply don't understand if you can't see how wicked that is. 
in Proverbs 6, the Bible says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in, in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Sowing discord, trying to get people separated among, among brethren in the church. Causing that division, splitting the church. God hates that. It's an abomination unto God. 1 Corinthians 11, look at verse number 8. I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians 11, excuse me, 18, not 8. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I probably, the Apostle Paul is already hearing about divisions and splits within the church and at Corinth. Why does he believe this? Verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Divisions and heresies go hand in hand. People spreading heresies within a church is going to divide that church. That's why it can't be tolerated. That's why it's a, it's a you know, uh, um, what's it called? A, um, no, the, the no tolerance, right? The schools have that, the, what's it called? The um, zero tolerance policies. Right? Well, in church, there's a zero tolerance policy on those that are spreading heresies within the church. They're gone. You want to come in here and spread heresy in the church? Gone. And no one ought to have sympathy and show pity on those people. And, oh, well, I'll go out and still talk with you. I'll go out and, and we can still hang out and be friends. No. You're doing a wicked thing. Get out of here. Get that leaven out of this church because you're not going to destroy the good work that God is doing here and sow discord among the brethren here. Turn forward to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's not, look, the reason why I'm preaching about this is because it's not comfortable. It's not the way that you're going to want to deal with things, but it's important that we deal with it appropriately. And do the right thing when, when the hard times come. Just as much as it's important to, to teach why you have to overcome your fear and go out soul winning. And just do those things that may, you know, it, it may make you feel uncomfortable, but it's the right thing to do. Overcoming these obstacles to doing the right thing. Overcoming your emotions and doing the right thing. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16, But shun, there's that word, shun, profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Remember Hymenaeus? He was already delivered unto Satan. He was one that had profane and vain babblings. And they're shunned. We have nothing to do with those profane and vain babblings because they're going to increase unto more ungodliness. It's just going to continue and get worse. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying, and look at what they did, Hymenaeus and Philetus, it tells in verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Hymenaeus was delivered unto Satan. You may not think it's a big deal if someone is teaching the resurrection already happened. Well, I don't see how that's a big deal. Well, the apostle Paul thought it was a big deal. Big enough to deliver them unto Satan. So what does that have anything to do with it? Because Jesus Christ, I mean the hope of our resurrection, when you're saying that the resurrection has already happened, your hope is in your resurrection because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. It's very important. But on the surface you might think, well, what's the big deal? A lot of people don't understand. Well, what's the, I don't understand. Who Jesus is, big deal. When you go out and talk to a, a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, don't you kind of make a big deal about Jesus Christ as God in the flesh? The deity of Jesus Christ? Isn't that kind of important? Absolutely, of course it is. If you don't have Jesus as God, you have another Jesus. The doctrines that impact, I mean, salvation and, and just the core faith that, that, that goes along with being a believer not every nuanced doctrine, but the core, I mean, like at the heart of Christianity. P 
people that come in and start having vain babblings, profane and vain babblings about, about these doctrines and kind of upturning them and, and, and spreading heresies like that, they need to be shunned. They need to be kicked out. They need to be delivered unto Satan. It's what the Bible teaches. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Someone teaching heresy in the church, like Hymenaeus, ought to be thrown out, delivered unto Satan. Turn, forward to, turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Actually, I already covered this, so we're, we're just going to close with this. It's already, we're, we're already doing uh, pretty long on time. The other reference to giving someone over to Satan says uh, you're, in 1 Corinthians 5, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And... Um, The Bible tells us what's appropriate. Tells us how we need to handle these situations. They're not easy to deal with. It's not, it's not, I'm not saying this is just uh, will come naturally to shun somebody, to kick them. I mean, maybe as we grow spiritually, it does come easier. But when our heart is actually right with God and, and in tune with his sense of justice and what's right, we have various difficulties, though, sometimes with our emotions and, and doing what's right. I mean, sometimes it's hard to hate evil if it's something that you have a tendency for. Sins that you're guilty of, you're a lot more likely to have compassion on, right, than sins that you're not guilty of. That's the way we are. I mean, that's our human nature. So if you walk away with anything, look, God is compassionate and pitiful and merciful and praise God for that. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying change your attitude to never show mercy to people, to never be pitiful, right? Not even close. But when it comes to something extremely grievous and serious, like a wolf coming in to destroy the church of God, the church that, that God has established here and the good works, don't be merciful to those people. Don't be merciful to Judas. Don't show compassion on someone that wicked. Be ready to turn them over unto Satan. It's hard to do because we want so much to bring people to Christ. Because that is really what we're all about and the work we're all about is. So having to turn someone over to Satan may be difficult. But when you see the full picture of what's being done, that they come in to destroy the work of you bringing people to Jesus, that's how you can realize, oh, that is really bad. They do deserve to be delivered unto Satan because they're just completely destroying us bringing people to Christ so that God can have the love and compassion extended to that many more people. They're diametrically opposed. So that's, that's why you, you, you hate the evil and love the good. And you, you, the, the person who comes in here to split the church, the wolf, false prophet, don't show mercy. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your instructions and the warnings, dear Lord. Uh, we as sheep sometimes, Lord, it, it is so difficult to comprehend how there can be wolves, how there could be people who are wicked and just out to destroy. It doesn't make sense to us, dear Lord. So we thank you for, for providing the information, for providing the warning to us to know that these things will happen. They can happen. They will happen. They do happen. But help us to be re ready to, pre to deal with it. Lord, help us to be prepared that our spirit would be right, that we wouldn't let our emotions dictate um, our actions and the things that we do, but that we can use wisdom and knowledge and instruction from your word to, to be the, the final determining factor for how we live our life and the actions that we do, Lord. And we pray that your name will be honored and glorified through the works of this church, dear Lord, and that you would, uh, you would help us and protect us to, to be able to do the utmost for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.